you again for coming to hear me. I know it's late at night, but you came. So, today, I'm here for you, so please think of your questions. I will answer all of them the best I can. I will first share with you some presentation. Uh, so I'll share with you, let me ask you first, how many of you have used Airbnb before? Okay. Keep your hand up if you use Airbnb as a host. Okay. As a guest. Okay. And outside of Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is good. Okay, now I know. I don't have to do this presentation. I can go. <laughs> okay, that's good. I'm very excited to be here. Um, first, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to all of you. You came to listen to me. I feel famous from knowing you. I don't think I'm famous, but because of you, I feel famous. I have to say a special thank you to, of course, the people who made it happen. Thank you very much for bringing me here. And to Heart Creation, because it's really made from the heart that we provide this opportunity to you to learn more about a company, about a person, and about skills that go beyond school. I also, of course, wanted to say a huge thank you to uh, YSL Corporation Hudshin for providing this lovely venue for us to be here today, and of course, Zhao Tong University. So without all of you, I wouldn't be here today. So thank you again for coming. So as they mentioned, I'm the country manager for Donaya, Shanghai, uh, Taiwan. So I oversee the business, it, both sustaining the business and looking at growth areas for the business um, in this part of the region. And today I'm going to share with you about myself first. So here's a look at my background. I mentioned earlier one of the five C's. I really believe in continual learning. It's not just in school and it's not just outside of school. It's everywhere. So let me share with you some examples. I studied electrical engineering at Purdue University. I really love to build things, test them, and break them. I also studied business at Columbia University, and I did an exec MBA at Berkeley. Okay, and also I studied some school at Stanford University. But I studied engineering there, and I decided to go for an MBA. So I only have half a degree there. I also study a lot online. So I will look at things like LinkedIn Learning, how YouTube. And on YouTube, I would just search how to use Excel, or how to use SQL, or how to play guitar. And that's how I become better at whatever it is I'm trying to learn. I read a lot too, not only books, but also on social media. I follow certain keywords on Twitter, and I will actually uh, keep track of what's happening in industries. And then last but not least, I believe in finding ways to learn new things. So I, in 2013, I went to Thailand to become a yoga instructor. I studied yoga for two months uh, because I was really curious if I could do it. My work experiences are very diverse. So some people like to go very deep into one area. I'm the type that likes to go broad. So I've worked in semiconductors, solar technology. I mentioned uh, applied materials. I used to come to Shinzu a lot. So I have a very special place for Shinzu in my heart. I also worked on me with media and online advertising. I used to work closely with Yahoo for one of my clients. I went to consulting after my MBA because I wanted to pivot in my career. And I thought if I go to consulting, then I can prove I can learn new skills and have a general enough background to move to another industry. And it was successful because the next company asked me to join them, and that was a finance technology company called Intuit. After that, I came to Airbnb where I've been for about over two and a half years. So values and inspiration, what drives me? My family, my friends, my community. Also what drives me? Travel. I like to stay active. I like to volunteer, especially mentoring young girls and women. And I have a very diverse background. My parents are from Hong Kong and Taiwan, so I'm very proud of that. I was born in the US, but now I live in Singapore. Okay, so how did I get to Airbnb? I think this is the interesting thing I have to tell you first. So I went to Puerto Rico about 2014, December. I landed in, let's see if I can do this. No, I better not try, I don't know how to do this. So I landed in San Juan. This is the main city here in Puerto Rico. I couldn't find a place to stay, so I looked on Airbnb for a place to stay, and I ended up finding a place here. I have to travel there by boat. The catch is, it's not just a home. It's a tent on the beach. <laughs> so when I went there, I thought, oh no, it's going to be a horrible stay. I'm going to be kidnapped. I'm going to be robbed. I'm not going to find it. 
I came at 11 p.m. with my sister and my friend, and we met our host. She's 21 years old. I asked her, why are you hosting on Airbnb? You're so young. She said, I need to earn extra money to pay for my books and tuition. I'm a student, and I can't afford my books and tuition. Okay? So that story was really amazing to me. That night, I slept in the tent, and let me tell you, that tent was so amazing. It's brand new. The mattress is memory foam mattress, so very comfortable, better than the one I have at home. She gave me a bag of toiletries so I can take a shower. She gave me a flashlight so that I don't get scared of the dark. I fell asleep under the stars, and I woke up next to the waves. You know how amazing that night was? I ended up extending my stay by seven nights. That was one of my first times using Airbnb. I was so happy about it that I started sharing the story with other people. I met another Puerto Rican couple, and they asked me, how did you find out about this island? No one comes here. And I said, oh yeah, I found out about it on Airbnb. And they said, oh, I have an extra house in, Air in uh, Puerto Rico. What can I do with it? Put it on Airbnb. Download this app right now, today. When I did that, I was thinking, I I'm doing this for free because I care about it so much. I might as well apply for a job. The very next day, I applied for a job at Airbnb. Okay, so first, we're reimagining re travel for everyone. I mentioned the end-to-end -end trips that we want to provide. We used to provide just homes. It started out with just a mattress, then a room, then a whole house. Now we're going into experiences. So if you're looking for a, an apartment for a night, or a castle for a week, or a villa for a month, you can pretty much find out on Airbnb nowadays. In fact, we have so many different homes. You can search for any type. I'm pretty sure you can find it. We learned from our Airbnb guests that 86% of them use Airbnb because they want to live like a local. That means they want to do the things that locals do. So if they come to Taiwan, they want to eat. I know you're going to hear this, nyo rou mian and lu rou fan. They want to eat what the locals eat. They don't want to eat French food or another type of food that is not local. OK, so then we decided, well, if that's the case, we want to have very authentic experiences that people can really connect with. Don't just go somewhere, live there. So here's a video that gives you an example of how people are going there, or living there. Don't go to Paris. Don't tour Paris. And please don't do Paris. Live in Paris. When you Airbnb in Paris, you have your own home. Make your bed. Cook. You know, the stuff you normally do. Don't go to LA. Don't go to New York. Don't go to Tokyo. Live there. Live in Malibu. Live in the East Village. Live in Shinagawa. Feel at home. Anywhere. Do your regular routine. Wherever you go, don't go there. Live there. Even if it's just for a night. And we also mean this for Taiwan. So I want to share with you someone I met recently. He has a, a home in Yilan. Have many of you been to Yilan before? Yes. OK, because of this experience, I fell in love with Yilan. So let me share with you why. So here he is with his wife. They're a couple that wanted to retire at around 40 years old and build their dream home on top of the mountain in Yilan. So every single week, they drove up to the top of the mountain with their things, and they designed their dream home. They ended up designing this. Eight rooms of beautiful design and creativity. Eight rooms that are now on Airbnb. And every single room is different and unique. This is the breakfast they served to me every morning. Such a delicious breakfast that I could have while I overlooked the mountains, the valley, and the pool that they have there. This is the view from my room. And if it's, what's really interesting is if you look at the top of this home, it tells something very unique about the host. So before he designed his home, he's a professor of entomology. Do you guys know what entomology is? It's the study of insects. This is in the shape of his favorite insect, the dragonfly. Let me share with you another friend that I made in Yilan. This is another host, Mr. Zhang. This is his house that he designed for his family many years ago. This is my room. This is my living room that I got to stay in. And this is my bedroom that I also stayed in. The experience I had here was so relaxing and peaceful. It was just what I needed, especially on a business trip. This is the backyard. 
he designed this because he wanted people to be able to go up there and climb to the top. So my coworker and I did just that. This is where we had breakfast every morning, and this is the fresh breakfast he had from the local farmers. So you see, both were in Yilan, but both were very different experiences. And it, it's all because they're two different people who are hosting me. And that's what Airbnb wants to do, is provide different, unique experiences that are different every time, even if you're in the same neighborhood. It's become a global community. So let me share with you how we're growing first. We started in 2008, as he mentioned. And over the years, we've just started growing really fast, especially in 2012, when we took off in Asia Pacific. So if you look over here, the red dots mean more than 1,000 homes. Now we have over 4 million homes around the world in 191 countries, 65,000 cities. And to date, we've seen over 250 million guests travel on Airbnb. But in order to understand our growth story and how we're able to grow, we have to go back to our roots. So let me share with you our founders. Our founders, Nate, Joe, and Brian, they were in San Francisco and they couldn't afford to pay their rent because it was very expensive. So they thought, what if we just rent out our little bed on the floor? Just give it to someone and charge $80. Let's see what happens. What if we do it around the time when they really need it? So there was a big design conference coming to town and they knew that people would have a hard time finding a place to stay. So they decided to quickly whip up a website that would advertise this part of their apartment. This is the first website they ever put together. They ended up receiving inquiries from three of their first guests. And that was the moment of that be history began. So they discovered that it wasn't just about renting out their space. It was about the human connection, right? Picking them up from the airport, cooking them breakfast, taking them to their favorite bar, dropping them back off at the airport. But they hit a lot of bumps in the road. And you, you may face this if you're an entrepreneur one day, to get funding, to get support. So what they ended up doing was taking a bunch of cereal boxes. This is around the time there was a presidential election in the US. And they rebranded it, so after the two presidential candidates. And they sold each box for over $30. They ended up generating over 30,000 US dollars for a round of funding. This is their way of staying entrepreneurial and keeping them uh, strong. And you're gonna see how this goes into our core values. So this was their original office, their apartment. This is our office now in San Francisco. This is uh, headquarters in San Francisco. Okay, so how do we grow without growing out of order? Like staying healthy, staying sustainable, uh, staying a, a strong collaborative culture. You need to continually innovate. And we have innovation everywhere from our product, our platform to our culture. So first of all, we have very strong core values. We believe in doing the right thing. What are core values? It's really the way we define how you work with each other. We have four main core values, champion the mission, embrace adventure, be a host, and be a serial entrepreneur. Be a serial entrepreneur is a joke on what I told you earlier with the serial. We also talk about champion the mission. So here's an example of what champion the mission means. Prioritize work that advances the mission. Build with the long term in mind, not only the short term. Actively participate in your company's culture and also the community. How do we maintain these core values threaded throughout our offices and our culture? We have core values interviewers. It used to be our founders who would interview everyone. But then we realized they can do about the first 100 people, 300 people, but then it gets really hard when you get to 3,000 people. So now we have core value interviewers where we train people to be helping us to interview for a cultural fit. And it's very important for an office that wants to be collaborative. Let me share with you an example of how we remain collaborative and how we've designed the office so that it is open for everyone to work in a healthy space. This is the call center, both a model of efficiency and a denial of humanity, a place where no one belongs. Airbnb's commitment to a world where you can belong anywhere demands a highly specialized understanding of customer service, something that can only be done in-house. It was time to start taking calls, but we knew there was a better way. If Airbnb were to redefine the work environment the way we redefine travel, we had to enter design with no assumptions and many questions. What makes an office an effective and functional place to work every day? The data was rich, but this was the headline. People wanted to work in a variety of positions in a variety of ways. So we developed a new type of furniture, the standing landing. 
a standing high workspace where one can hang their jacket, store their laptop, and charge it overnight. This is how it works. The footprint of a traditional desk is subdivided, providing a compact, multi-use surface for the individual and giving the remaining area back to the collective. In this way, we can give everyone a single place to land, but many places to work. From here, they can easily spread to adjacent areas. The dining room table, the living room, the den. Power and data are everywhere, meaning that one can be equally functional in any position. This call center has no phones. Agents have comfort and freedom analogous to staying in a great Airbnb listing, bringing the experience of agent and traveler closer together. Spaces are shared. Unlike in a typical suburban office, where amenities are simply added until the individual's footprint becomes massive. By decoupling personal space from the notion of a desk, we are able to provide the same level of variety, but maintain the square footage per person of a typical call center. This is the economy of sharing. Our philosophy became the diagram, and the diagram became the space. We replaced the anxiety of free desking with the ability to belong anywhere. So this is the economy of sharing, not only in industry, not only outside of the office, but inside the office. Here's a picture of our headquarters in San Francisco. We want you to feel like you're in a park and you can collaborate over uh, some grass. We also have this cafeteria in the Singapore office. You can see that's a very open atmosphere. You can come here anytime and work from the cafeteria. Here are more pictures of our office in Singapore. If any of you ever come to Singapore, you have my personal invitation to come visit us. I will give you a personal tour. Here are some more conference rooms we have. So it feels like you're going camping. And this is another conference room that I work from very often in Singapore. You can see that it's modeled after somewhere in Bangkok. The inspiration we received from this is actually from a home in Bangkok. So all of our conference rooms are designed after our own listings on Airbnb. That one was inspired by a home in Bangkok. This one is what we call a Cappadocia, Turkey. This is in the Singapore office. This is what has inspired the home. We asked all of the employees to come together and design this type of room. And we had a big competition for them as well. So continual innovation is important, not only in the office, but also in the rest of the economy. And it's important because first we have to understand how did the sharing economy come about? It was born from five megatrends, people, technology, climate, economy, and travel. There's two sides to it really. If we understand the way the sharing economy works, you can see there's labor and capital. And as the sharing economy expands into other areas, you're gonna see a lot more adjacencies between different organizations, companies. It's a very codependent world. And there are so many different things you can share so you can share basketballs even. You can also share cars, homes, pets, tools, gardens. You might recognize some of these companies, right? Do most of you recognize these companies? At least two? Yeah? You might use them, right? So there are tons of sharing economy apps and you can expect to see more going forward because a sharing economy really allows for other types of in ideas to uh, come into the platform and you'll see that there's a lot more different opportunities. There are a lot of jobs being created uh, for the sharing economy and jobs that you would never have guessed would be here. And it's perfect for the generation like you because you are studying and you're probably at a job right now or you're going to start a new job or you're going to look for a new job. So it's really interesting um, how the sharing economy might impact the way you apply and uh, think of jobs. All right, so I think some of you are starting to fall asleep. So let's go ahead and do an experiment. So everyone take out your phone. Need a soji. Make a soji maha. Okay. So can you unlock your phone? Yeah, password, unlock. Now, can everyone take their phone and give it to the person to the right? Okay. So now go ahead and look at the phone that you have. Yeah, go ahead, take a look at it. What is on the home screen? Take a look. Oh, how do you guys feel about this? Does it feel uncomfortable? Does it feel uncomfortable? It feels really weird, right? Okay, that's how it feels in the sharing economy, right? These are the types of opportunities and challenges we have to deal with on a daily basis. It's not only Airbnb, it's every company. So the owner of the phone, how do you feel? Can someone tell me how they feel? Lin Lao is so insecure. 
Who else want to answer? How? Panic. Panic? <laughs> what do you have on your phone? <laughs> okay, hi, say. How did it make you feel as the owner of a phone? It's interesting. She's happy. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. How say? Ha. Huh. Too many notifications. What does that mean? Ah, okay. So he has many messages, and then he has to show someone else, and maybe they will. It's like, oh, why didn't you clean up his notifications like that? Okay, last one. How say? Ha. Huh. You're excited. You're excited to pass your phone over. Or you're excited to see your neighbor's phone. <laughs> ah, there's secrets in the phone. Ah, okay. So that's an, I like that answer because what's really interesting is all of us keep our phone close to us, and every single one of us really, I'm sure, like really care about our phone because we use it every single day. You use it when you want to order things. You use it when you check your email. You take pictures. And now you have to give it to someone else. You feel like insecure, which is what Lin Lao Tzu said. You feel a little infringed on your privacy. You don't expect it. You never expect to have share your phone with someone else, right? That feeling is something that's very important for us to always remember at Airbnb. So I mentioned empathy earlier in the fireside chat. We always have to design our product with empathy. So I wanted you to feel that because if you go into the shared economy type of company, you will have to understand that. So thank you for joining me on the first case. Get ready for the second case, okay? No more falling asleep. Okay. So why is this important? Well, the economy sharing platforms are going to be here to stay. And why is that? Our people are changing. The way they work, the way they live, it's all changing. So one example is that we have more freelancers. You have artists by day, you have drivers by night. You have people who are doing social media by day and they're bartending at night. How many of you have one job? Oh, it's still, you gotta have one job. Okay, more people. How many of you have two jobs? Two jobs, maybe you're doing one for free, maybe you're helping a friend out. Oh, Han Chang, this guy has two. How about you, two? Okay, you are gonna see by 2025, 75% of you will say that you have more than one, one or two jobs. So it's very exciting. In fact, let's look at the global uh, millennial generation, and this is the generation that will be impacting the most. So 53% of this generation has said that they started more than one job by choice, or started freelancing by choice. 78% left traditional jobs and said they started earning more money within the year. In fact, in Taiwan, it's really interesting. 58%, more than half Taiwanese workforce, now gets income from more than one source. So you're going to see an increase in Taiwan over the next five years. So I mentioned earlier, people are changing. They're changing, and in fact, a lot of them are moving to the cities. There's rapid urbanization, and this is a big deal because as you know, um, here in Taipei, I'm sure, in Taipei Shinzu, you're gonna see that there's rapid urbanization and that impacts the global workforce. Also, the largest living generation right now are the millennials. So I'm sure many of you are millennials. So about 18 to 35 years old. Three out of four millennials would rather spend money on life experiences or life changes, events that impact their lives over owning something desirable. This is research that we've seen before. Can I ask you, does that make sense to you? If someone gave you $100 today, would you go buy a purse or would you go invest it in a trip to travel somewhere? If you would invest it in a trip, can you raise your hand? Okay, so that's definitely already almost more than half. The next generation we should be watching out for is the one that's following all of you. It's called Generation Z, so anyone born after 1995. What's interesting about Generation Z is they're starting early. So maybe I started this at 18 years old. This baby is starting to look at phones. Three, millennials use three screens on average, so phone, iPad, maybe computer. Gen Zers will use, on average, five screens. And they're quick to learn. They self-educate online. They make their purchases online. They're very internet savvy. This is very important for most of you who are either joining a, some sort of company or starting your own company. 
people are changing, travel is changing as well. So travel experiences are very different, and this is very important for Airbnb to think of these days. There's a rising middle class, so people who have uh, time and money to spend on travel, but especially in Asia Pacific. I mentioned earlier, Asia Pacific is one of our fastest growing regions for Airbnb, and we're going to see more and more travelers coming the, to this part of the region. And travel globally now makes up about 10% of GDP, and that's only going to increase. So if we look at Taiwan, this will be interesting for all of us here. Our guests up to Taiwan primarily come from Asia right now for Airbnb. We're seeing that they're coming from China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, and of course from the US. The other thing that's important to note is that technologies are changing, and I don't have to tell you this. You know that everyone's going to be getting onto the internet at some point, if not already. And I know that all of you are probably already on it. So we expect 4.7 billion internet users by 2025. So what the cars were to the baby boomers is what the phones are to millennials. And I don't have to share that with you because I'm sure you already know. But what's really important to note is that technologies are changing. And as they keep advancing, we'll have new opportunities as well as new exciting uh, life, uh, life enhancements. One type of technology that's coming our way, whether we like it or not, is artificial intelligence and robotics. And it's estimated that for every robot that enters, we'll have about six to seven jobs lost. So here's the thing, there's a lot of frustration or worry that jobs will be lost. But at Airbnb, we really believe in job creation. So in economy sharing, I mentioned earlier that you can pretty much find any sort of idea and any way to build a business. I can't tell you how many people come up to me, maybe 10 times one day, does Airbnb want to partner with my company? We are Airbnb for pets. We are Airbnb for dogs. I can cook breakfast for you. I can clean the Airbnbs. I can drive the Airbnb uh, guests from the airport to the listing. I can help the Airbnb guests check in. Just pay me 10%. I mean, these are all the different types of ideas, and I can't even share with you some of the most interesting ideas that we've heard. So I think that really the sky's the limit when it comes to any sort of job creation uh, within the economy sharing area. And Airbnb has created many jobs because of this. So let's get ready for the second case study. Okay, business travel. I'm going to go through this pretty fast, but uh, let's see if you guys can listen. I think we might have some prizes for people who can answer some questions later. So business travel is going to be really important, especially for all of you, especially as you, use, as you travel for work. So we realize that business travelers want the same type of feeling that Airbnb guests have when they travel for leisure. They want to be able to work, but also uh, relax and not have to feel like they live out of a suitcase. So we were approached by a company called Salesforce to help them out with a big conference called Dreamforce. They expected about 170,000 attendees, and they knew that these people might have a hard time to find accommodation. The thing is, we weren't ready for them, but we didn't turn them down. We said, let's make this a case study. What they wanted was, we had to be a serial entrepreneur, so that's why I put this in there, to remember we're serial entrepreneurs. First, we listened to them. What do they want? They want to be able to streamline the booking experience. Their travel managers have to be able to have visibility and manage the expenses. They also want high quality listings that their employees will enjoy. Okay, so knowing all this, we designed business travel for Airbnb, where you can search for homes, work from them, and still feel like you're in a business travel ready type of home. So here's an example of a business tra travel ready home. And now the business travel ready homes have a little badge so you can actually see which ones are uh, business travel friendly. And when they're business travel friendly, maybe it means that they have Wi-Fi, uh, a laptop friendly workplace, self check-in, shampoo, hangers. This is an example, but we can read this later. That's a note for traveling for business. And this is a way that you can pay. So you can see that we made it a lot easier for travel managers and we were able to partner with Salesforce to reduce the friction and to actually use Airbnb for their employees. Here's an example of how else you can use Airbnb while you work. So there are many companies that will now approach us to use Airbnbs for team building. Sometimes in Singapore, I will even use an Airbnb to bring my team there for brainstorming on strategy for the company or to do team building so we can help to get to know each other. There are kitchens as well, so some people like to cook while they travel. And these are many of the companies that use us today. Maybe you recognize one or two of them, or maybe all of them. 
even banks are using us. And one interesting thing about this is that the, what, the reason why they use this is because their interns went and requested to use Airbnb for business travel. And why this is important, three out of four, 75% of the global workforce will be millennials by 2025. And millennials say that they want to be themselves at work. They want to feel like they can work comfortably, like they're working from home, and they want the flexibility. Okay, case study number three, and we're almost at the end. If you could make one thing in your daily life easier, what would it be? So take out a pen, maybe think about your answer. I mentioned earlier that there will be many different types of jobs created in the economy sharing area. My thought is that anything in your habitual routine, from the moment you wake up to the time you make your coffee to the time you go to work, maybe you have kids and you need to pick them up, maybe you go to have dinner with someone and then you can go to bed. Every single moment has an opportunity for some sort of economy sharing idea. What would you like to do differently in your life to make one part easier? What would help to have someone come and make it easier? The traffic part. The traffic. Yes, I definitely agree with you. If we can make that easier in some way. Do you have an idea of how? Not yet? OK. Traffic. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. Eat healthy food. Yes, that's right. More and more people want to eat healthy food. But how do you access healthy food? And how do you make it? Do you have time to make it? Where does it come from? How do you know it's healthy? Right? Many questions. OK. Yes. Uh, filter out the notification that I don't need. Ooh, this is a good one. I'm sure many companies need help with this. Filter out the notifications that you don't need on your phone, right? Yep, it's very true. So many times when I look at my phone, I have a headache. Too many things coming my way, too much information overload. But if someone could help me to filter out notifications, I would pay the money for it. I would definitely want to invest in that. So the same people are answering questions. Star students. OK, who else? Yes, laundry. Yes, that's a very important one. <laughs> yes, if somehow we can make laundry easier. So for instance, if do you have any ideas? Maybe uh, if, if we're available to do all this laundry, and we can apply for it. <gasps> Ah, OK. So if people could apply to do other people's laundry, that could be a good way to alleviate for each other. This is an interesting point. So now, if no, OK, we're in business school, right? So now we can talk about this. My job as a general manager, I have to oversee the business. What does that mean? I'm always looking at the business as a whole, supply and demand, right? So what would supply be for Airbnb then? Host and homes, right? Supply would be the host and homes. The host, those who have the space to rent out. Demand would be guests who are looking for accommodations. So every country, even every city, has a very different supply and demand balance. And so as a leader, I always have to look ahead. I use data. I use insights, third-party insights. I talk to communities. I talk to our hosts and guests. I talk to local governments to understand what is the need there, what is the opportunity. So this is very interesting that you just mentioned laundry. And his idea was if we could have someone apply to do the laundry, that would be very beneficial. And it's true because he doesn't want to do laundry, but maybe someone else wants to do laundry. And then you can balance out supply and demand, right? And really provide an opportunity to someone else who wants to do it. So very interesting. I think everyone will agree with this. Charger. So even if we have outlets and we have portable charger, right? I, I forgot what it's called Mandarin, but you know what I'm talking about with the portable charger. For some reason, it's still not that convenient. I, I, sometimes I will forget it. I don't have that one charged enough. I can't find the outlet. When I'm in the airport, oh, every airport is different. So I agree with you. That's a pain point for me. Any other ideas? Oh, yeah. To get knowledge faster. Ooh. Is it legal to do this, though? <laughs> no, I get it. To get knowledge faster. I understand that. Yeah, who wants to work hard? I just want the knowledge in my head. You know? uh, so to get knowledge faster, this is very interesting because I think you're going to see in the next 10 years, these types of questions and answers are not going to be unique. I think they're going to be really interesting. People will actually try to find a way to do this. So very interesting. Who else? Anything you think of that you want to make easier in your life or to have help with? I think I will provide 
the unique answer. I think no one else will provide here. And breastfeeding, you know, when you have a baby, <laughs> breastfeeding when you have a baby, it's really a tough job. Ah, actually, that's very interesting. So Shao Lao said breastfeeding. I think that's a very good answer. Because if you have friends who have had babies, you will know exactly what she's talking about. 100% of them say it is the, one of the worst parts to having to raise the baby in the early part of the life. It's very painful. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot of risks. It doesn't mean your body can handle it. So that's a very, very interesting answer. Yeah. Hi, let's say. Someone raise their hand. Okay. Avoid the odor from my balls. Oh. Okay, this is interesting. Avoiding uh, orders from his boss. Is that what you said? Yeah. Is your boss, I hope he's not watching. He won't know it's you, <laughs> right? Who's your boss? No. <laughs> I understand. Um, so this is interesting. How do you solve for avoiding orders from your boss, right? So that would be an interesting one to alleviate. Okay. Anyone else have anything they want? These are very interesting answers. I thought you were just going to say making coffee or cooking dinner. <laughs> okay. Hi. I like that one too. So she said, someone who can help me wake up earlier because it's very difficult to wake up just by an alarm clock. That actually is very true. So if many of you use alarm clocks, you know exactly what the pain points are. One is that if you have the same sound every day, you can become used to it. Two is that you can also turn it off. It has no way to take over you. You can take over it. Three is that you're depending on a machine, something that could be battery operated or out of power or something that malfunctions, right? So there are so many different reasons for why it may not work and may not be um, effective. So that's a perfect answer to that is that you'll see in some, at some point in the next year maybe, next two years, someone will come up with an alternative way to replace the alarm clock. Someone can help uh, like senior family member to have Ooh, so someone who can help senior family members to a hospital, in a hospital. Go to the hospital. That is very exciting. So I know that's already a big opportunity these days, right? So senior family members, maybe your grandparents, maybe even your parents. So those, sometimes they're susceptible to being sick or they need to have go for checkups. If you're over a certain age, you need to see the doctor more often, but it doesn't mean you have flexibility to leave school or work to go drive them there. You also may not feel comfortable to just send them to uh, a random person. So you having a way to take them to the hospital and then uh, taking care of them, that's definitely a really good opportunity. Oh, yes. Is there any apps that can count every like uh, money you spend? Things like you travel, like when you book the hotel, you put the fire tickets, and like you spend at the restaurants, some, some sort of like that. So an app that can count how much money you've spent, track everything you spend while you travel, you book your hotels, you buy your flights, you eat out. That's very interesting. And what she's tapped into is something that we actually face every single day, right? So we're in the travel industry, and we're always, uh, one of the things that people want to know is how much they're spending on each part of the journey. And so that's a very interesting thing that I think everyone can relate to as a pain point. Yeah. Last one, anyone else? Oh, yes. Someone can help me do the grocery shopping. Are you married? <laughs> Someone who can help him do grocery shopping. This is very interesting too. So I'm sure some of you know that some companies have started asking themselves, can we help people do their groceries? And are there people who want to help with groceries? That's very interesting. So I'm closing it out, but all the people who just answered, I can already see you have an entrepreneurial mindset and these are great ideas. Every single one of your ideas is very interesting. So you can expect that these types of ideas are very welcome in this type of area of the shared economy. Okay, so please don't lose your spirit on that. I think it's very interesting. Thank you for participating. So I'm gonna close out this presentation now and then I'll open up for Q&A so you can ask me any type of question you wanna ask. Earlier we talked about travel planning. We wanna make it magical and easy. It's too time consuming now. You have to search so many different things and there's so many resources and doesn't mean they're all reliable. You don't even know if they're all reliable. So we started, uh, we launched experiences and it's really rooted in the philosophy of the hero's journey. I don't know if some of you have heard of the hero's journey, but basically guests when they travel, they want to come and take this big journey. They want to have that story where they like took on a challenge, they fought some sort of villain, they overcame it, and they became victorious. When they go home, 
they are left a changed person. So a lot of people want to go soul searching, they come home and they're changed. This type of hero's journey is what inspired our experiences. This is what people want when they travel. But unfortunately, this is what people see. So when they go somewhere, they have to wait in line to buy a ticket to the same place that other people want to go to, to take the same selfie in front of the same location that everyone else is taking and post with the same caption that everyone else is posting because it's mass-produced tourism. Airbnb wants to be the opposite to mass-produced tourism. And here's one example. In Singapore, we launched experiences in early March. Let's say you want to learn how to make dumplings. It's like our jiaozi, right? But they have one called sun kui. So there's a man who really knows how to make sun kui well. He's a local hawker stall entrepreneur. He teaches you how to make the best sun kui skin and filling. And you can learn with your friends or you can meet new friends and then eat with him. In Bangkok, we also launched experiences. So let's say you want to learn how to fight Muay Thai, which is a big part of the Thai culture. Here, Matthew and Dunk, they're local celebrities who are known for lifestyle, fitness, and Muay Thai in Bangkok. They taught us how to fight Muay Thai. I got to train alongside professional fighters. But the exciting part was they brought me to a real arena and I got to watch it up close. Professional fighters fighting just like I had been taught. That's the exciting part of experiences. It's only the beginning. So I hope that we can continue to grow experiences across Asia. So stay tuned for that. We'll be having some very exciting news uh, coming up shortly. So I want to close out today by saying that I've shared a lot of information with all of you. And I know this is a lot to share in just less than one hour. But one thing's for sure is that Airbnb is like a rocket ship. When I first got offered the job, I didn't really think too much about it because as Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook once said, when you get, if you're offered a seat on a rocket ship, you don't ask which seat. So I just jumped on. And earlier, Shalas asked me, what is your leadership style and how do you continue to lead with your groups? I really do believe that to go forward as a strong leader, you want to embrace change and be open to challenge. And if you stay curious and hungry as students and beyond class, I think that will take you really far. So thank you again to uh, Zhao Tong Dasher and all of you, especially Hexing <laughs> Corporation, let's say that, uh, for hosting me today and for letting me come talk to you. I know I spoke in English. Maybe next time I see you, I'll translate all that in Mandarin. So thank you again for coming. Thank you.